Now, in talking about the problem of suicide, it is real. The problem is very real. So I decided I wanted to give you some data to help you fully grasp just how real this problem is. If you look at Texas Suicide Safer Schools, there's an article that can be found there by Dr. Scott Poland, as well as Dr. Donna Poland. It was published in 2015. The data that they showed was that suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 through 24 nationwide. The suicide numbers that I recently gave to you may not fully reflect just how many suicides occur. The reason being that is that many do not like the stigma of suicide. And so there's a great chance of underreporting. Youth suicide is a serious public health concern. And it continues to increase. Part of that increase is due to social media. Many youth cannot get away from social media. And they are being pounded with some bullying issues, negativity. Social media leads to constant exposure to those sort of factors, which can lead to suicide. Did you know that in the United States, more people die by suicide than homicide. Most adolescent suicide tends to occur after school and in the teenager's home. Most adolescent attempts are triggered by social conflict, which obviously knowing high school and middle school, there are lots of conflicts between significant others, and peers, which is why you see triggers from that. Not all adolescents are forthcoming in their desire directly, so you have to really monitor and ask the important questions when a suicide attempt or risk for that has been noted. Preventive measures can be taken and lives can be saved. In defining the problem, the more you know, the more you can be aware of how to recognize those factors. Attempted suicide is potential self-injurious action committed with some intent to die. Suicide is really an attempt to solve a problem of intense emotional pain with impaired problem-solving skills. Individuals of all races, creeds, income levels, education levels, do die by suicide. There is no stereotypical suicide victim. One of the other things is, as I mentioned previously, ages 10 to 24 their second leading cause of death is suicide. But I want you to know that there are few sets of kids as young as ages seven to nine that have killed themselves. The data shows that the leading methods, meaning the most common methods of suicide, was by firearm or a gun. Roughly 49% of suicides, 38% is conducted by suffocation or hanging themselves, and the last 7% is done by poisoning, whether it be drinking a poisonous substance or drugs. Those three are the most common methods. And looking at different groups of individuals, that may be at high risk. Males 
are more likely to actually die by suicide than females. The reason behind that is that males tend to choose a more violent or lethal means of suicide, such as a firearm. Females, on the other hand, are more likely to attempt suicide. Among racial and ethnic groups nationwide, typically American Indians or Alaskan Native youth have a higher suicide risk. Also, which I'm sure you are aware of, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered youth report suicide attempts at a significantly higher rate than their peers. In looking at what are the common risk factors, there's a whole list of them. Typically, a victim of bullying or severe humiliation could be at risk. A history of trauma or abuse is a huge risk factor. Family members that have died by suicide, physical illness such as cancer, or even a mental health issue that is severe can be a risk factor. Substance abuse, stressful life events, a breakup with a significant other, severe argument with family or friends, a recent loss of a loved one, failing in school, or loss of a dream, such as not making the basketball team or the dance team. Not making the team, that loss of a dream. Another example may be not getting a college scholarship, which can be a risk factor. Also, severe school discipline, arrest, and easy access to lethal means, meaning easy access to a gun can be a high risk factor. Exposure to suicidal behaviors of others. For example, I do want to talk a little bit about that. Exposure to suicidal others, for example, on television shows, they sometimes appear to glorify suicide, and repeated exposure to that can lead to a risk factor. So keep your eye on that. Also, that sense of being a burden to others can be a high risk factor. Profound sense of loneliness, alienation, or isolation. Engaging in risky behavior or actions, such as promiscuity, drug use, or even something like street racing, those kinds of activities are risky. Other risk factors can include that feeling of being trapped, of being stuck with nowhere to go. Anxiety on an ongoing basis can be a risk factor. And last but not least, sleep difficulties. Ongoing sleep disturbances or inability to sleep can lead to cognitively impaired thinking. I want to explain some risk factors. When there's a history of trauma or abuse, there was a study conducted roughly in 2012 that showed that one third of adults who were physically abused during childhood did consider suicide at that time. That rate is five times higher than adults who were not physically abused during childhood. Bullying, as I mentioned before, which I cannot emphasize enough, students are involved in bullying, whether it be as the victim or the perpetuator. They are significantly at higher risk for depression and therefore could lead to suicide. 
the risk of bullying through social media can significantly increase the instability of hopelessness in youth that are already dealing with stress. Also, I do want to talk about the significance of disconnectedness for students who are not connected to their school, their classmates, school activities, and are generally isolated need to be monitored. For those students who do not really volunteer themselves in class activities or choose to isolate themselves, help them find a way to get that sense of belonging. That is incredibly important in your school. If a student does not have a sense of belonging, they become further isolated. Also, look at the sense of burdensomeness, which refers to a student who views themselves as a burden to others, perhaps a burden to their family, a burden to the school, and feel that others would be better off without them. Students who engage in reckless behavior or have unexplained injuries need to be watched for. It is important to know that students that receive severe discipline have some sort of support as well as counselors being updated with that information. Now, since talking about suicide, I want you to know, well, I'm assuming that many of you work with deaf and hard of hearing students. So I do want to explain about risk factors directly related to the deaf and hard of hearing population. As you already know, based on all the risk factors I listed off that can impact students, which is applicable to hearing students, it also applies to deaf students. However, Poor quality of life and mental distress are oftentimes associated with the increased odds of a completed suicide. Deaf and hard of hearing people typically have a lower quality of life and their mental distress is oftentimes elevated. Deaf and deafblind individuals have a high risk for mental health problems compared to their hearing peers. Deaf and hard of hearing individuals often have a low education or low socioeconomic status, as well as a high rate of untreated psychological issues. There's also a high risk of substance abuse within that community as well as unstable employment. Deaf and hard of hearing people also have high rates of characteristics associated with suicide, such as emotional distress, unemployment, and child abuse history. So, risk factors that are more specific to this population that have been identified or suggested are as follows. Oftentimes, deaf and hard of hearing people do not have role models available to them. There's simply not enough out there. Also, feelings of being disconnected from their family or peers. Increased risk of abuse. As many of you are aware, disabled people are often at a higher risk for abuse. And the same holds true for deaf and hard of hearing. Also, social isolation. Social isolation, if you think about it, consider where you're at. If you live in a rural area, that's even worse. There may be no deaf role models, no interaction with your family, which can lead to further social isolation. Many deaf and hard of hearing individuals struggle to accept themselves, struggle with their self-image or identity, Many of them do not have the ability to accept who they are, and those struggles can lead to suicide. Other risk factors include separation of a parent and child, peer relationship problems, meaning unhealthy relationships. Another factor is information gaps. Oftentimes, 
deaf and hard of hearing people have a fund of information deficit. Both language fluency and receptive language can be impacted, which leads to language deprivation, which has a huge impact on suicide. Long-term stress is a big factor. I also want you to be aware of those individuals who were previously hearing that maybe had a medical difficulty which caused a hearing loss. Tinnitus and Usher syndrome as well can be a contributing factor in 29% of suicides. Increased difficulties for deaf and hard of hearing people in accessing mental health services. If you think about it, Texas is at the bottom of the list of states that have services available. So for mental health services in the state, being limited already, and then you take into account a deaf or hard of hearing person that cannot access communication, may not have access to an interpreter, those further struggles can lead to increased issues with mental health versus their hearing counterparts. When you consider all of those risk factors, as well as the feeling of being a burden and feelings of not belonging, as well as the age of onset of hearing loss and access to treatment, you can just imagine that experience. It's very heartbreaking. So risk factors aside, I wanna talk about warning signs. But keep in mind, this is not a comprehensive list. There are additional warning signs, but these are the general ones to be aware of. A big one is talking about suicide, making statements of feeling hopeless or worthless. Those sort of statements should be monitored. Also exhibiting depression, a history of mental health, fixations on death, such as watching a lot of movies with a lot of death and blood, perhaps writing stories about death, that fixation is a warning sign. Also taking unnecessary risks or exhibiting self-destructive behaviors is another warning sign. Engaging in non-suicidal but self-injurious behavior, such as cutting, burning, or things like that, or warning signs. A person who is bullied by someone, as well as the perpetrator of the bullying, are both at risk and is considered a warning sign as well. When you see a child acting out of character or non-typical behavior, perhaps a significant change, Maybe a child typically dressed well and then suddenly uh, has poor hygiene, starts dressing in all black. Something that is not typical, a clear change, can be a warning sign. Someone who loses motivation or has a lack of interest in things that used to interest them can be considered warning signs. Visiting or mentioning to people that they care about in an attempt to say goodbye can be a warning sign. Also arranging their affairs or getting their affairs in order. For example, making sure things are taken care of, family members are taken care of. Those are warning signs. Also giving away treasured possessions to others is a big warning sign. And last but not least, exposure to suicide on a repeat basis, whether it be via the media or in their personal life, is a warning sign. So we've talked about warning signs and risk factors. 
but what are the factors that can help prevent those from escalating? With risk factors and warning signs, you need to make sure to keep an eye on those. If someone has what we call protective factors, then they are less likely to lead to suicide. For example, positive relationships with family, peer, and communities. If they have a positive relationship with people in general, they are more likely to get help. Also, positive self-worth, self-control and regulation. Also, connection to school and extracurricular activities. Having those positive relationships with their teachers or anyone at school is a nice way to protect our students. Also, having access for those who reach out for help that students know what to do, how to get help, if being able to do so, they're less likely to be suicidal. Also limited access to lethal means, which will reduce the likelihood of suicide. Having access to a variety of clinical interventions, for example, school social worker, counselor, school psychologists. All of those individuals can help with intervention. Also, early detection and intervention are very helpful. Other protective factors include coping and problem-solving skills, especially with the deaf and hard of hearing population. There's often a gap in problem-solving and coping skills. If we can teach them coping and problem-solving skills, they are better able to move forward. Most importantly, are you and me. We are important. We can prevent this from happening. Okay, so now I know that there are many people out there who do not receive the necessary training or have a lack of information, and that's okay. But I do want to share some common suicide myths that are out there. I am still surprised by how many individuals believe some of these. So I'd like to correct some of those myths for all of you. One myth is that if a student really wants to die, it means there's nothing that we can do about it. The fact is that even students who are at high risk for suicide can still have the desire to live despite wanting to die. Report them. They want to change. Those type of statements show that they want a change. Another myth is that suicide tends to happen without warning. In fact, it's very rare for suicide to occur without warning. A person that plans for suicide oftentimes gives clues to his or her intentions. They may not be recognized at first, but they are there. Many of us are not trained to find them. Another myth is that young people that engage in self-harm behaviors, such as burning or cutting, will not attempt suicide. The fact is that young people who engage in self-injurious behaviors can lead to suicide due to their increased comfort level with hurting themselves. Another myth is if a person exhibits great improvement after a suicide crisis or attempt, then the risk has passed. Evidence shows that most suicides occur within three months after that previous attempt. This occurs because the person has the energy to act on it. They're able to say their goodbyes and put their affairs in order. Those myths are common but should be dispelled. If you know what to look for, know what to pay attention to, you have the opportunity to prevent this from happening 
and save lives that way.